Another glorious day in the Corps. Every day in the Marine Corps is like a day on the farm. Every meal's a banquet, every paycheck a fortune, every formation a parade. I love the Corps. Sergeant Opone, shortly before his death on LB-426. Another glorious day in the Corps is a brutally difficult campaign game for one to six players, which sees you enter into Hadley's Hope, fight through the Xenomorph Hive, and desperately try to get off world before you're overwhelmed by the alien menace. Players can play through a three-mission campaign with two additional optional missions, depending if you want or if you have to take them, depending on how well your campaign's going, as well as one-off single mission uh, bug hunts, which is basically a survival mission where you're sent to a location with minimal equipment, you have to scavenge it, you have to survive, you have to defeat the entire Xenomorph threat before getting victory. You first start by selecting your own character from the cast of the movie, each with their own strengths, weaknesses and abilities. But don't fret too much about which one you're taking, because you will always play with a full roster of six characters. The only difference being is the ones you selected are flipped to their hero sides with better stats and more powerful abilities, whereas the others are left on a grunt side, which is lesser, uh, they're not quite as good, but still very useful and good to have along in a pinch regardless. On your turn you can take two actions with your character, either moving up to your move value, Attacking hostile alien models, barricading doors to keep them at bay, aiming to make your next shots more likely to hit, interacting with crates or computer tokens on the board, playing special card actions to give you an edge in battle, or resting to manage your exhaust deck and keep you in the fight for longer. But what are these decks of cards about? Well, the Endurance deck represents your quickly diminishing strength and resources and willpower to continue. As you do actions and take shots at Xenomorphs, you take cards from the Endurance deck and put it into the exhaust pile. The further in you go, the more actions you take, the less this pile is going to be. So it's up to you to manage it. You have to get cards out of your exhaust pile by taking the risk of not shooting Xenomorphs, not doing actions, just to keep your strength up. If you badly manage these decks, you may end up discarding cards entirely, not just from the mission, but from the campaign, meaning that you'll never see them for the rest of that run. Now, the other deck is the Motion Tracker deck. Now, this one is drawn towards the end of the turn and is almost always filled with bad news for you, as it lets more blips, which represent an unknown number of aliens, appear back on the board, ready and waiting, lurking in the shadows, trying to hunt you down. What's nice to see is that each mission has its own little setup sheet, which clearly details the map you're fighting on, set up by these four included tiles, where all the component placements need to be, where your miniatures start, and also on the other side is a quick mission brief telling you why you're here, what you're fighting for. And I love the fact that these are individual and not in the manual itself. It means you can just quickly pass it around the table if someone's confused about what to do or wants to quickly check up on a rule that's specific to the mission. Whilst the campaign may be on the shorter side than most people are used to, just having three essential missions it keeps the tension going throughout the entire time by being so difficult to complete these three little missions. Every dice roll, every draw of the card could mean the difference between success and failure and that keeps you engaged the entire way through. So let's quickly give ourselves a quick glimpse into what an average turn of Another Glorious Day in the Core would look like, going into what the player actions are and what they do, but also the threats you're going to face along the way. Well, the first thing you do when you start your turn is you reset your aim dial. Every character has one of these, and it's the figure that represents what you need to roll when shooting a Xenomorph model. Each time you fire in the turn, it decreases by one, with you resetting it to the stated value on your character board at the start of the marine phase. Next, you resolve a character's on-action ability if they have one, because not everyone does, and they may not necessarily be what you want to happen right now, but you have to follow it through each time you activate. In this example, Ripley activates and gets to recycle two cards from the exhaust deck into the endurance deck, and then draws the top endurance card. You may end up drawing a hazard this way, or you may end up drawing a useful bit of equipment. The fact of the matter is, you don't get a say in whether you draw that card. From there, your character may equip any useful bits of gear they might have found, like body armor or a nice weapon that's better than the one they currently have, paying the cost that's found in the bottom right of the card when they do so. So, say for example, Ripley's just found a helmet which will help keep her alive, and you pay the cost in the bottom right to place it on the character board in order to use it. Then you perform two actions in your turn, as mentioned earlier, but we'll go into each of those actions now in a bit more depth and explain what they do. So, moving is pretty self-explanatory. You move a number of squares in any direction equal to the speed number on your character board. You can go diagonally, with some exceptions, such as if there's a protruding white line in the square you're moving into. 
Attacking is also very straightforward. You attack with a weapon at a Xenomorph model in line of sight and range for some weapons and roll the d10 marine die. If the figure you rolled is equal to or less than the value of your aim dial, you've hit and killed a Xenomorph. Some weapons will let you keep shooting if you hit a target or have splash damage, but always after firing a shot you reduce the value of your aim dial by 1, so the next time you shoot it will be harder to hit your targets. Barricading lets you block or unblock a tunnel token or doorway to let you pass or keep xenomorphs out. To do this you roll the marine die against your character's tech value, and if you get an equal or less value you can choose to block or unblock it. Blocked access points have a 50-50 chance of stopping a xenomorph from getting through the door or spawning on a tunnel or spawn point, so it can be a very tactical decision of whether you shoot the xenomorphs that are in front of you now or you block a hole to prevent more from getting you later. Aiming is also very straightforward, it simply lets you just adjust your aim dial to increase its value by 1, so the next time you take shots at a xenomorph model you are more likely to take them out. Interacting can be used on various tokens for different effects, you might be using a computer to peek at how many aliens are underneath their unseen blip, rummaging around in a crate to find more gear, or freeing a captive from the alien hive. Always a good idea to check the mission sheet here, as what you can do, especially with the computer tokens, tends to vary with mission to mission. Card actions are for the yellow event cards that you may end up drawing into your hands. If one seems like it's a good idea for the situation, using as an action will let you play its effect, and you may have to exhaust cards if there is a cost on it as well. These cards can have random or situational effects, but playing the right one at the right moment could be the difference between success and failure. Resting is what allows you to get cards from your exhaust pile back into the endurance deck, and managing this is extremely important. Because if you ever need to spend cards to do ability or take a shot at a xenomorph, but you don't have any left in the endurance pile, instead you have to discard them from the exhaust pile, not just from the mission, but also from the campaign, for good. If you run out of cards completely, that's it. It's game over, man. Game over. So with the actions you can do in a turn, it gives you a lot of potential options. And sometimes the most obvious solution isn't the one that saves you. So there's plenty of tactical depth here, even though these uh, actions are quite simple in and of themselves. Characters also have a end of activation ability sometimes as well. And just like the on activation ability, it's unless it specifically says the word may in that ability, the actions here are not up for debate. But that's not all that happens in a turn, as once your marines have finished with their activations, the xenomorphs get to activate. And this is the point where all your hard work and planning starts to completely unravel in front of your eyes. At the start of this phase, any revealed xenomorph models immediately and automatically get to move six spaces towards the nearest marine model and attack them. Meaning that unless you spent both of your actions moving, they will eventually catch up to you and attack. If a Xenomorph is about to attack your marine model, you get one final chance to try and gun it down before it actually attacks them. This is known as defensive fire. If the alien model had to move in order to attack, it means that all marines in line of sight and four spaces get to attack once. If they kill it, great. If not, it takes a swipe at the closest marine model. The Xenomorph then rolls the D10 dice and compares that to the marine's defense and melee value. If the roll is less than or equal to the melee value, by some miracle the marine actually manages to kill the xenomorph in close combat, as well as surviving its attack. If the roll is less or equal to the marine's defence, then it survived the onslaught with no damage caused. If it's higher, however, the marine character is knocked down and unable to perform actions next turn without intervention. If they're still knocked down at the start of the next alien phase with a xenomorph stood next to them, they get dragged off to the alien hive and removed from the game. But it gets worse than that. If the value rolled was 10 or more, the marine is instantly killed and removed from the game. No ifs, no buts, they die on the spot. And for obvious and horrific reasons, they're out of the game not just for the mission, but the rest of the campaign. But how exactly do you roll more than 10 on a D10? Well, that's the hidden threat here. When there are multiple xenomorphs in a single swarm, for each additional alien in the stack, the number you just rolled is increased by one. That means it is less likely your character will defend themselves, more likely they'll die, and can make the chance of a melee kill absolutely impossible sometimes. Did I mention that when you shoot at an alien model and score a hit, you only remove one from the stack? No? Well, now you might be beginning to see the threat posed by these Xenomorph models here. Yes, you can shoot them down at range quite easily, just one hit will take them out. But on the flip side, just one hit from any Xenomorph has the potential to instantly kill a Marine from the board. 
Now you're beginning to see the challenge here. Every single Xenomorph has the potential to one-hit kill a Marine, and there is a whole lot of them coming after you all of the time. That's just the most obvious and immediate terror posed by an active Xenomorph model. But there is another, more insidious dread at play here, which is the blips. After any active Xenomorph models on the board have moved, the blips then activate and start to creep closer to your position, moving d6 squares for each blip on every tile. You, as a player, have no idea how many Xenomorphs are under each blip, so you might find yourself terrified of three blips that only have one Xenomorph each, or press forward confidently thinking you can handle a single blip with one or two Marines when you round the corner to find a full swarm of five. Bearing in mind as well that if a blip ever ends its movement next to a Marine model and is revealed, it gets to attack like a normal Xenomorph swarm, so it should never be underestimated the threat that the blips pose. And that's just the threats that are immediate and present on the board right now. That's completely discarding the next thing that happens, which is the Motion Tracker cards. Now, right next to the Endurance deck is the Motion Tracker deck. You draw a number of these at the end of each turn, depending on how many actual people are playing the game and end up placing more and more blips onto the board. You can get a rough idea of how bad they're gonna be by looking at the face downside on the top, and you do get a tiny amount of wiggle room with certain items and cards to manage this deck somewhat, but unless you are seriously lucky, all of these cards mean nothing but bad news for you. So that's just what an average turn looks like then. At the start of the Marine phase, you're gonna feel powerful, like you have all the time in the world, all the options, all the abilities to take back and beat off the Xenomorph Tide, but, as the alien phase progresses, that tide will become ever more stronger and wear you down. You will start to face losses and that early optimism is going to be replaced by a creeping sense of dread. So let's discuss some of the things I absolutely love about this game. The mechanics, the feel, the aesthetic, they all serve to really draw you into the mission at hand, as well as the fact that you know that every turn could lead to disaster. You are forever concentrating on what you're doing at the time. I absolutely love these little lane dials as well next to the thing. They're such a wonderful tactile thing. Um, obviously, they look like the ammo counter on the pulse rifle, so very wonderfully thematic there as well. And what I do really appreciate as well is this little card organizer that they've included as well, just to separate the motion tracker endurance deck. It's just nice for keeping these divided, and it lets you know if your uh, exhaust part's starting to get a bit wobbly and might need a bit of reorganizing. And I've not even touched on the thing that actually drew my interest to this game in the first place. The miniatures that are included with this are ace. I'm a huge fan of assembling and painting these models, which have a surprising amount of detail to them. I even liked the base finish of the, plastic, uh, the black plastic that the Xenomorphs are supplied in, that I didn't actually feel the need to paint them on their own at all, as they have just the right level of shine to really make the details on them pop. I like as well the level of content that's provided in just the base set. Yes, Objectively from the outside, three missions in a campaign does sound short, but when you take into account as well that it's two additional optional missions that, being real, once you start to take losses and burning through your equipment, you may actually need to take those and extend the campaign, as well as the inclusion of the one-off bug hunt missions, this had me engaged for weeks on end. I absolutely loved coming back to this one because there was always something new for me to try. And the fact that the campaign was so difficult meant that you might have to repeat it. You may have to go back and try again and do it differently. But because it's uh, shortened the length of time to it, it doesn't matter that much that you have to come back to it. It's less of a drawn out experience and much more concentrated. And I find that much more of an enjoyable way to frame it. I like as well how easy to bring to the table this is for a campaign game. Usually when you're planning a long campaign with your gaming group, you have to convince people to sign up to what may turn out to be a month or two month long experience if you've only got one day a week to play it through. With this, I'm reasonably confident we could be at a campaign in this in just a day or two. It's such a lovely condensed experience and I think that actually works in its favour because of that. I like the fact the length on offer really melds with the idea as well that this is a difficult campaign that you are expected to fail. You're going to struggle with it. But because it's short, it works for that. Like, imagine if your gaming group had sunk two months into a campaign only to fail at the last hurdle and finally you have to restart the whole thing from the beginning. That's two months down the drain, gone. With this, it doesn't matter. You've only been at this for a couple of hours and yes, the defeat was crushing, but you see where you went wrong and you want to immediately jump back in and have more of it. And that's just the campaign. That's discounting the fact that the bug hunt missions exist. 
and far from tacked on, these are their own separate mode entirely, and I absolutely love the variety and additional game time they bring to the package. Because you're not playing through the campaign missions, you don't have objectives as such. It is a raw survival and scavenger hunt. Instead of starting with fully laden characters with all the equipment you could have, you are sent into the Xenomorph Hive with a pistol each. That's it. If you want to survive, you've got to dive into the map. You've got to run past those alien spawn points, find the crates, dig around and get the gear you need in order to survive. It is... It plays out longer than some of the campaign missions, but it is a much more frantic and intense experience. The raw value contained in this box is astounding to me. Like, for me, the cost justified itself with the quantity and quality of the miniatures alone. That's what initially drew me in. But when I cracked this open and I looked at the tiles, the components, the wonderfully little tactile dies, uh, dials that come with it, it just sold me on this whole experience. It's such a wonderful self-contained box. If you want to dip your toe in this, this is a complete experience. You don't need the expansions. I mean, I ended up getting them anyway because I loved it so much. But you could very happily just buy this one box and that's it. You need nothing else to go with it. And just at £50 cost, this is a very reasonably priced game, especially from someone that's used to playing Games Workshop money for his games. This was a wonderfully refreshing experience for me. I got the volume and quality of miniatures I wanted, as well as a complete experience. Like, this is such an appealing product to me. And that's before you take into account, like, online third-party sellers that will probably sell it for cheaper than that. I have absolutely loved my time playing Aliens and Other Glorious Day in the Core. It is something that has been keeping me engaged the entire time. I'm always tense when I'm playing this game because I have no idea what's going to happen and I'm loving every second of it. Now, please bear that in mind because this next bit I'm going to go into is some of the faults and problems that I have with it. And hopefully I'm going to lay that it is not a perfect product. So, what is it I don't like about this game? Well, there are some specific points that I'm going to go into, but there is a general overarching one that I'm going to say first, which is that um, I feel they've created a very simple and easy to engage with system with the game, and then went about picking it apart in all little different ways by adding little unique rules here and there, just to add some complexity that I'm not entirely convinced was needed. Right, so first point, doors. And I'm going to illustrate my point with this, so I'd like you to play along if you can and just have a look at this and see if you can get it right and how long it took you to get there. Okay, so this is a board from Kill Team Arena. How many doors are there and which ones are open? Now, here's a made up map from another glorious day in the core. How many doors are there and which ones are open? Now, I think the solution to this was very simple and almost basically right there. I may end up house rolling this myself. The barricade tokens you have, one side's blue, the other side's more white. Why don't you just have one of those sides as red with door on it? Then you would have a physical reminder of, oh yeah, there is a door on the board. It stands out to me. I know it's there. And if a xenomorph moves up to it, I'll just move it out of the way. The door is open. And if it moves off, it goes back. That's all it would have took, I think. And I'm, as I say, I may end up house rolling that in future content myself. Next, stacking xenomorphs. Now, I'm really okay with the idea of putting tokens underneath the xenomorphs to indicate that the swarm is bigger. It means there was less miniatures they needed to print and you can have way more xenomorphs on the board at any one time. But the one thing that gets me every single time is when you have to move the leaning Jenga tower of xenomorphs and the tails are so long and spiky, they always get caught on each other and get tangled up and then the whole tower falls over. I think there could have been a better solution to this. Maybe like a little ring to go around the base of the Xenomorph model with like a little number poking up out of it just to say how many there are in it. Might have been a solution to that. I think just having so many, especially with like when you've got groups of four and five all tightly stacked together in these corners, it just ends up knocking each other over and just being a bit of a pain. So when you're looking at one of these board tiles, the thick white lines mark the edge of something that you can see past but can't move over and the black line marks something that is completely and utterly impassable. The problem is though, why make those lines black? Especially when you consider that the aesthetic of the board they're going for, whilst wonderfully deep and thematic, it's very dark. Especially on the Xenomorph Hive tiles of this board, it is extremely difficult to just at a glance know where the thick impassable walls are. There are plenty of times where I'll just re-examine something and realize, oh, hang on, I can actually see around that corner because it's not the hard 90 degree angle I thought it was. I'm really just scratching my head up why they would make it black on a dark board tile. Like, if you want to keep in theme and in the colour scheme of the Aliens thing, why not just make it a nice little yellow like this? Like, it doesn't have to be super bright, just a little bit of pop to it would really make it easy to see at a glance where these impassable walls are. 
So speaking from the modeling aspect of it, a very minor point I have is that on the uh, Marine one, the character sprue, the space really quite far apart. And I think with just a little bit better management, you could have actually squeezed more onto that sprue. It would have just potentially given people better value for the money. Um, but the bigger complaint is with the Xenomorph ones. Now, not the sprue itself, that one's been very well done. Like, it's very cramped in there. I also like the fact how you can actually like pose the Xenomorphs ever so slightly. You've got two optional heads and tails, and the arms can be ever so slightly posed. So each Xenomorph model I've got here is unique, but it's, it's unique in a line them up and spot the difference sort of way. But my big problem is with the tails because they've got this little ball joint on there. Now, I know they're aiming to try and have it so that you can adjust it a little bit here and there, but it's resulted in a very weak joint. And especially when you consider that there's no actual storage solution in the box for the Xenomorph models to keep them separate, what you're gonna find is a lot of broken tails from your Xenomorph models. I currently have three that are damaged and need repairing at the moment. So just a very weak joint. Like it should have been like a hole in a cylinder sort of thing instead of a ball joint, because then you could still turn it and add a little bit of adjustability, but it would have been much stronger overall. Ah, now, one thing I glossed over is that when activating characters, you're supposed to go by rank. With the player who's got the highest rank starting first and activating grunts, then they pass the player activation token to the player on their left. Why? Like, I understand that um, you're trying to add a bit of theme here and meaning that the rank of the characters have some meaning to it, but ultimately, once the... It, it doesn't even really play into the theme of the movie that much, because that rank only lasted until Gorman completely flubbed it. And then everyone just kind of devolved into, okay, who's the strongest personality here? I mean, Hicks was giving the orders towards the end, even though Gorman was still around, but it, it just feels like they're trying to sacrifice um, some player freedoms and choices on the altar of living up to a theme. And I think that was the wrong sacrifice to make. It just needlessly complicates the game. And honestly, I've never followed that rule because I, I find it so nonsensical. So imagine this for a second, picture the scene. You're alone in the dark hallway, just you and your pulse rifle, just going down this long, creepy, dark hallway. And then all of a sudden, a xenomorph comes barreling around the corner, trying to scratch your eyes out. You open up with the pulse rifle, fully automatic. You miss your first shot and immediately stop firing. Because, I mean, that's the gentlemanly thing to do. You, you've missed your first shot firing on fully automatic. There is no reason why you would want to possibly keep shooting the xenomorph that's coming straight at you. I, I understand what the rule here was trying to do. It's trying to add a bit of tension here. Oh no, you missed a really easy shot or it's supposed to stop you from just mowing through a horde of Xenomorphs by getting lucky, lucky, lucky. But I, I think that was the wrong call to make. One, it, it doesn't make sense in universe. Like, trust me, if something nasty is coming at me and I've got a gun, I am emptying that thing until either it is dead or I am out of ammo. And I think from a player perspective as well, it would really help to be able to do that. It gives you the choice of, Okay, I've, I've kept missing, I've kept missing. Do I gamble? Do I keep spending cards on a doomed thing just for the chance of maybe killing it? And because then later down the line, you've got the problem of, oh no, I've run out of cards because I spent them on a stupid decision. And I think giving players that choice as opposed to forcing them of, oh no, you've missed something fully automatic on the first shot, that's it, that's your shot done. Like, I don't think that was the right call to make. Uh, next, event cards. Now, let's be real. They're a bit useless. Um, when you draw these things, they are always so random or specific or just situational. Like they reply to a very specific situation and that situation is not now. You're in a dire straight, but the event card you just drew can't do anything about that. And I understand why you've uh, put so many of these in, especially the weak ones, is to kind of fill out the endurance deck so you don't immediately empty it as you're playing the game. It also allows you to squeeze every last possible reference to the movie as you can into one deck of cards, which is quite nice and use all that artwork. And I do appreciate it for that. But I think the skills on offer could have done with a bit of tweaking. A lot of them rely on uh, revealing another card and then based on the color of that, you do a certain thing. But um, uh, it's too random to be useful. Like, it's a very rare situation where I've gone, aha, I have the perfect event card to solve this, I know it will work, I will spend it. It is often much more reliable just to shoot your way out of a situation than risk going on an event card and getting the wrong thing. So, the balancing mechanic the game has on offer for when you have more or less players in the game, which is quite nice, I think as well it helps if, uh, say, one of your mates has to go home early, you just flip their card to a grunt and carry on, or someone's running late, so... Yeah, most of you are here, he's only gonna be half an hour, so we'll just start with that and put him on a grunt. When he gets in, flip it over back to here. Great, I like that as an idea. My problem is, is with how they balanced it from this. Um, so it's supposed to be that 
you draw additional motion cards depending how many players are in the game, but the number you draw is a bit finicky. If you're playing a one player game, you draw two cards. If you're playing a two player game, you draw four cards. If you're playing three player, it goes back to three. And then it goes in by one per player from there. So four is four, five is five, etc. Uh, bit of a weird decision there. So why is it that a three player game is objectively easier to do than a, four, uh, a two player game? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, d I just found that a bit weird. I, I know that you didn't want to do one per player because if you were doing a solo game, then, then you would just be drawing one card and it'd be way too easy. Um, so why not just have it as a lower limit of draw two cards if you're a solo player and then from there one card per person. That would have been so much more simpler, made so much more sense. Okay, so that last segment might have made it appear I have a lot of issues with this game and I stand by what I say with those, but none of those things I've just mentioned have negatively affected my experience of this game to the point where I don't love it, because I do. I love playing this thing again, so I get so out so often, I'm always engaged with it, it just, ah, oh, it is such a good time, man. It comes highly recommended from me. And personally, I can't wait until everything that's cracking off in the world right now is blown over and I can get a big group of people together and just dive into Hadley's Hope and have ourselves another glorious day in the core. Yes, there are some technical and uh, thematic things I don't agree with here and there, but I love this experience and I'm absolutely convinced that even if you're not a super fan of the Aliens franchise, which I'm, I wasn't, like uh, I've not seen the film completely the entire way through the first time until I like got this on pre-order because I wanted to get myself clued up. But, yeah, so speaking to someone that wasn't a super fan of the Aliens franchise, I have bought in completely to it at this point. I love this experience so much, and I absolutely know that you will as well. So, thank you very much for watching this. Uh, if you want to share your experiences with the game, if you've got it yourself, if you've got questions you want to ask me, then leave them in the comments down below, and we'll see you in the next one. This has been Dale of Wombat Wargaming.